And we are live. Uh, people, stop complaining you can't hear anything because it only matters if we're on screen and if you can hear me now. Um, so now is a good time for us to check it out. Um, welcome, everybody, to Brain Food Live on Air. It is episode 222, um, and we're bringing it to you every Friday, no fail. Um, and today uh, we have a very exciting show for you because it's something that we really need to talk about. Aging societies, folks, a demographic crisis. Um, we, we know uh, we need to do a better job of getting access um, to the labor market um, of people who are beyond uh, sort of the typical group of people we hire. This is the over, uh, the over 50s and beyond. How do we handle all of that? Um, uh, so this is the, the story of the show, age and ageism. Uh, but both of those things are real. Um, what are we going to do about it? That is the nature of today's show. Um, so, folks, very wel much welcome uh, to you. Um, let's just make sure everyone can hear me okay. I think Crowdcast is fine. It looks like you can hear me fine there. Uh, we are live streaming across multiple uh, channels here. We should be live on uh, LinkedIn for sure. We should be live on um, Twitter as well and on Facebook. So if you can hear me in all of those places, uh, do let, let me know whether that is okay. I'm going to quickly check my phone uh, whilst we say hello to Steve. Well, w w welcome to the show, Steve. Wonderful to see you. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Good to be here. Can I also say, Stephen, you actually look exactly like your your profile picture. Um, <laughs> Handsome? Well, is that the word you're looking for? I, I would, gorgeous, gorgeous <laughs> would be the word I would, I would personally uh, I think is more appropriate. Um, uh, but, uh, but yes, by no means a, a, a catfish. Uh, so anyway, uh, <laughs> great to see you, Steve. We're live on LinkedIn, so good to see everybody there. If you can hear me on LinkedIn, do let me know in the comments whether that is okay, um, and we should be good to go. Okay, cool. We are okay. Um, folks, before we kick off any further, we need to say thanks to our sponsors, as we always do. Every week, Recruiting Brain Food, Brain Food Live has been sponsored. I think we've been sponsored every week for like four years. Um, so it's crazy the amount of support we're getting from uh, the uh, recruitment technology com uh, community out there. Uh, this week, it's one of our repeat sponsors. It is Greenhouse, folks. Uh, we all know Greenhouse. It's it's year on year, I think, the most popular ATS as voted for by our community, uh, the Brain Fooders. Um, and we're going to see how they come in this year's survey. So the survey is still ongoing. Um, I'm going to pull out some data on that, but I'm pretty certain uh, if they're not at the top, they're going to be very close to it. Um, if you are looking for an enterprise-ready ATS and you want to upgrade, Greenhouse is one of those companies that definitely needs to be on your list to look at. I will share a link to Greenhouse in case you don't even know. Uh, Greenhouse.com, of course. Uh, but you can check out there. That is uh, their tracky UTM, it looks like. So uh, you can go ahead and check it out there. Okay, cool. Um, let's say hi to Steve Jewell. Steve, it is your debut as the co-host of Brain Food Live. So thank you, firstly, for stepping in and upgrading Adam Gordon for us. Um, wait, no, wait, no, no. There's no upgrade on Adam Gordon. I'm just hey, a fill-in, right? Steve, I get it. Steve, Steve, it's a very low bar, mate. Um, <laughs> you, just, you just need to be... On air, uh, the camera needs to move. And I don't have the great. scruffy beard. I don't have any of that, you know, Euro look. But um, it's a, I do it's, like it's, the contrast, though, of white and black shirts that you and I have going on. That's I, I do like it as well. You kind of look like a Rembrandt, if I don't mind, if you don't mind me saying. It's like all of the, the, wow. the tones at the back there. So I think the contrast looks great. Really, no <laughs> more. Yeah, I don't need that kind of advice or that kind of adulation. Thank you, though. Anyway, Steve, why don't you um, sort of introduce yourself? Who are you? What it is you do? Yep, very good. So Steve Jewell calling from Minneapolis, uh, South Minneapolis, in the great state of Minnesota. I'm actually wearing my Minnesota Twins t-shirt. I share that only because our baseball team is in first place in our division by, I think, six games. And uh, so that's a big thing in the Midwest. Baseball season is coming to a close and we're getting ready for the, the boys of summer or the boys of fall for a you know, baseball season to come to playoffs. So that's kind of a big deal. Uh, native Minnesota grew up in uh, a beautiful town called Duluth, which is about two and a half hours north of here. Spent my first 25 years in that small little, we call it the San Francisco of Minnesota because there's homes up on the hill. It's a harbor town. If you've never been to Duluth, uh, highly advise it. It's become a kind of a tourist attraction for people. Uh, went to undergrad there and then uh, off to Michigan State for grad school, go Spartans, and uh, then started my career in human resources. First 20 years or so as a HR practitioner, 
and then jumped into recruiting and never looked back. So you can even say things like first 20 years and then you did recruiting. So how long have you been yeah. recruiting for now, um, Steve? <laughs> I think I've, I hung my shingle out as a full-time dedicated recruiter about 93. So I'm coming on 30 years. That's crazy. I, you, this is, folks, I'm, like the, I'm like the poster child for this event today because I'm <laughs> – Let's get the age thing out there right away. I'm 65, just turned 65 in January. Uh, have no plans to retire. Um, very active in a lot of things, uh, including work. Um, I am a contractor. I've been doing contract work for the last three years. And maybe others on the call may find that contract work uh, is a suitable alternative to full-time employment that many people uh, either get squeezed out during the 2008 recession or more recently the pandemic. And so the contract economy, the gig economy is alive and well. And I personally have found that to be more fruitful than trying to apply to full-time positions for a variety of reasons and barriers that we can talk about. Well, yeah, we'll definitely talk about this. But uh, but yeah, first, the massive, uh, uh, great to have someone on the screen that has this type of experience. You must have seen the recruitment industry evolve over over uh, uh, so many iterations. So great to have you on the show, Steve. Um, let, let's review the newsletter, man. Um, did yeah. you have time to read it? Uh, if so, give us a couple of things that was interesting, um, Steve. So uh, I'm kind of curious about the disruption of, or the the comments that you made about how you spend your free day. What would you do with your day off? And the, the survey that uh, you put out, that most people, would, uh, 36% would spend their time doing admin work. So if you had a free day, what would you do with your free day? And I, it was a head scratcher for me because um, unlike the UK, we don't get as much time off. Uh, and when we do, uh, we don't even Americans don't even use all the time off that we have on PTO. That's crazy, crazy as that sounds. And so if I had a free day, the last thing I would do is spend it doing admin work. Um, I think the chillaxing was probably the, the highest rated uh, category. But it, it was a head scratcher for me that people would even put down doing admin work is what you do with your free time. Yeah, I mean, I've got to be honest, I was one of those people that voted that way. And the reason why, and it's no excuse, but um, I'm one of these that struggles with multitasking. Um, and particularly because, you know, the fuel you need to give to the company, you need to give to whatever you're doing, everything gets neglected, including life admin. Like I've been trying to buy health insurance for the last 10 years or so um, because I just haven't found the time. But it's just a lack of prioritization is the truth. And it seems a lot of people have that problem. And folks, if you didn't know, we run a poll every week on Recruiting Brain Food newsletter. If you want to take part in that, just sign up to recruitingbrainfood.com. And essentially what I'm trying to do is ask a question and get a gauge from the audience how they feel about things. I think it's a really good way to um, just get a, a sense uh, as to where we're at uh, in terms of these topics. Um, cool. Give us uh, another thing that was interesting, Steve. So uh, the, I'm a big football fan. We're getting ready to start the NFL season. Um, it sounds kind of male stuff, but a lot of people are football fans, fantasy football fans. I was kind of surprised to see that uh, G.C. Stroud from Ohio State is like number one rated quarterback that people are excited about him and both for fantasy and um, as a start of the season. I would not have picked him as my poster child for the NFL. Well, no. I mean, what was interesting here, so folks, if you didn't know, NFL is going to start. And, and essentially, this guy, CJ Stroud, has been named the uh, starting quarterback for the Houston Texans. Um, and obviously, he's just a, a high draft pick. He's basically a very, very raw individual. And the Houston Texans actually have a very capable veteran um, that, is, that has been effectively demoted. Um, and I just thought to myself, you know what, very interesting, because here is like a, 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 an organization making a decision, I believe, um, for the long-term interest of the organization. So this guy's the future. They're going to give him the reps. They're going to give him the practice. And, you, you know, he, that's going to be good for the organization long-term. However, if we are talking about assessing someone for, you know, in a meritocratic way, um, what, what does it mean? How we talk meritocratic? Because this guy is currently not the best quarterback for the Houston Texans. Um, he's going to make a load of mistakes this year. He's going to cost the, the, the club uh, games. There's a guy sitting there who is much more familiar, much more capable at this moment, just with a lower ceiling. So 
So I just thought to myself, okay, could we even think about applying that in, 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 an, in a professional context, in an organizational context? And if we did, would we be immediately uh, be subject to some sort of discriminatory policy or whatever? I mean, it's related to ageism, Steve, isn't it? Because of course. let's well, say it's ageism and it's also it's potential versus performance. So his performance at the college level is very different than what you see in the NFL. It's a faster game. Uh, there's more schemes. There's just more complexity involved. And, and everyone knows that, you know, making that jump from the college level to the professional level is difficult. And to be, to be able to think that you're going to jump in year one and be a high performer, it's, you're putting a lot on one player. 100%. And I'll tell you something. Here's a little sort of, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll move on next topic after I drop this controversy. But I will say this. I think hiring for potential is basically our, a new version of um, cultural fit. Um, it's basically a, a, a little bit of a rebranding of some of those decisions we want to make, but we can't actually say we, 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 we're making them that way because it's so intangible. You can get away with a lot of decisions that would otherwise not meet any true objective standard. How the heck do you measure uh, potential, for instance? How can you even think about that when it's decontextualized as a, a characteristic? Or are we actually starting to say, oh, someone you know, permanently has this amount of potential compared to someone who has permanently less amount of potential? Um, it's a very, I'll very high risk. Thing, Hung. There's a gentleman, a quarterback out of USC, uh, senior, and he's considered one of the highest ranked quarterbacks in college football, he's not sure he wants to go in the draft because he doesn't want to go to a, a poorly ranked team like the Cardinals. So even the player might say, maybe I don't want to go to uh, the first, be the first draft pick because I don't like the team I'm being selected for. And you know what? That's another topic that's worthy of recruiting brain food because the drafting system itself, I think, is massively controversial. And there's lots of things you can talk about that say, you know, where is the freedom to, to move? Uh, surely the employee, which is what this player is, should be able to choose who the employer oh, is. Um, anyway, give us one more before we jump into this, Steve. Yeah, I'll um, go right to the eighth bullet, which is about the, the aging workforce in the world and the migration of the, the aging workforce, which is what we're here to talk about today. Uh, there'll be more people, older people in uh, across the globe uh, than ever before. And we don't have the institution's infrastructure to support aging people in general, regardless of the employment scenario, how do we handle, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, housing, um, social structures for social um, connection and uh, alienation. And so there's a lot of issues on a structural level across the globe that we're just not ready for as our populations age in various countries. And the United States is no different than that. Uh, right now, I think I have some stats somewhere in my pile here that there are more people aged 65 and older than there are five and under in the United States. In the U.S., yep. In the U.S., right. And mm -hmm. yet you look at countries like Africa, which has a booming uh, age uh, of working age population. That's where the labor force is going to really explode in countries like uh, like Africa, or not continents like Africa. Yeah, absolutely. And we have Nom here from South Africa, actually one of the examples huge population i think the um the kind of median age of south africa is probably early 20s or so so they've got a huge amount of working uh labor that's available that's reflected really throughout much of africa also um so that's where the labor force is going to be whereas north america europe east asia all of those places where you might be able to say have got a advanced economies um are all showing exactly the same signs aging workforce as a result of people living longer, but people are having less and less kids, um, which means that that is a pipeline issue. We're simply it's not- a, It's a tax to issue too. There's a tax base issue of what's going to support all the uh, entitlements and social services that company or people have come to expect and live with. Look at the change in the, um, the retirement age in uh, Europe and how that was received so uh, with so much uproar because- Going from 62 to 64, I think, was the the uh, recommendation. And you know better than I, the reaction was uh, almost like a uh, upset, a riot. Yeah, absolutely. And you can understand that as well. I mean, a lot of people kind of, um, uh, you know, ridicule the French for like always being on the streets and always protesting. But I actually think this is a very powerful way in which the French workers have expressed uh, their position on it. And just imagine if you're like, 
a person had that had planned your retirement to a certain a sort of age. Um, you've organized it this way, and then suddenly, by law, that's been extended by two, three, four, five, however many years it might be. You might understandably be annoyed by this, even though it may be necessary at a national level. Um, well, if you're living you longer, huh? I mean, if you're going to live to 90 years old, that's a, a real burden on the infrastructure system that supports that retirement package. So here in the United States, we're kicking the idea of changing the retirement age from 66 and months to you know 70. And, and it'll obviously have a grandfathering system to accommodate more people close to retirement. But there are challenges with social services and systems if you don't have enough tax base to support that, uh, you're going to run out of money before, before you, when you need it. And that, that is the crisis, folks. We, we, we're, we're at a, 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 moving on to the top, this topic of conversation. Uh, the reason why um, the multi-generational workforce is something that I think TA will increasingly need to care about um, is because of this factor. There is a candidate shortage of multiple sort of sectors of the economy. Um, and accessing the labor force um, that currently is underutilized, underaccessed, is absolutely key to unlocking that. Let's bring on some sort of uh, uh, people who basically have, have experienced um, uh, difficulties in re-entering the job force after a period of, of, of being out. Uh, before we bring Cindy and Heidi on, actually, um, Steve, let, let me ask you the question. Um, I mean... In your sort of experience, when did you did you experience a sense that a, your age became a factor when you were a, a candidate going for work? Uh, do you did you feel that that was the case? Um, if so, how did you know? Um, and uh, and and you know, what, I think we, we understand how you've dealt with it by moving more in a, a, a sort of contractual basis. But um, but yeah, tell us a little bit more about your experience as you've kind of journeyed through your career. Sure, that's great. Uh, and everybody has a story. I mean, ageism isn't uh, just tied to uh, old people, right? Uh, you bump into someone and they say, excuse me, ma'am, excuse me, sir. Oftentimes that's kind of taken as an affront. It's not a compliment. Uh, you're being treated differently than a regular chat, right? So you kind of go, well, I, uh, why am I being be treated as if somehow I'm in a different uh, age category? And that's when you realize, you look in the mirror and go, well, oh, I am older. I'm 65 years old. I'm, I'm, I've got graying hair, receding hairline. There's lines on my face. And, and uh, we all experience that at some point, whether you're 40 or 50, everyone has their own definition of what old looks like. But one day you wake, you wake up and you go, you know, I'm not 25. I'm not 30. And uh, I had a couple of contracts now where I've been on teams with five decades of workers, people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s and 60s. Actually, someone who's 19 as an intern. So really five decades of workers. So being in that kind of work environment has its challenges. Uh, I jokingly referenced to someone that was, um, I went to a grocery store recently to buy some pancake mix. It's called Crust, Crusty's Pancake Mix. Very flavorful, tasty. And the cashier said, I don't know where, where that is. I said, it should be in the pancake aisle. Dude, I don't see it. She goes, I don't know what Crusty's is. I said, well, it's like the Simpsons, you know, Crusty the Clown. And she looked at me with this blank look like, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, you know, The Simpsons is a pretty popular show, and Krusty the Clown is kind of a pretty popular cultural reference. But So I have to be mindful that I'm dealing with different generations that don't know what I'm talking about when I mention The Simpsons. And Simpsons is not like an old person's TV show. Okay, okay. So I think this is really interesting. Um, so one of the things that we need to think about is – like where where there are generational gaps, perhaps uh, that feel most acute is when we share like cultural conversations. And of right. course, every generation wants to have their own cultural conversations. They actually As deliberately, should. right? Yeah, they deliberately separate themselves away from their parents. That's normal. Therefore, there is going to be a gap. Their own music, um, their own uh, jargon, their own you know lexicon of uh, of, of uh, vocabulary. I mean, yes, it, every culture, every generation wants that, and they deserve that. That's absolutely right. Uh, but as a candidate or as a person that's going into the workforce, that may be something that you need to be conscious of, even as a recruiter. Think about this, folks. Because you are a recruiter, subconsciously, one of the ways in which you will probably be judging whether someone is good or bad fit for your organization is whether they share the cultural language. This is part of the reason, by the way, and I think, Steve, you kind of uh, 
uh, made recognition of this when you kind of caveated your interest in, in the Minnesota Twins is that certain types of um, uh, kind of cultural interests are going to be exclusionary, inclusionary debate based on uh, various demographics. So as your recruiter, we have to be very conscious of the fact that if we're talking about various things outside of the, the focus of the job, we may be inadvertently creating barriers to people that might not want to enter. Um, okay, cool. Let, let's bring on some of our guests. Let's um, uh, uh, crack through this. We're going to bring on Cindy and Heidi, uh, two experienced recruiters um, who uh, I, I think are going to kind of help us have a think about this on the candidate side of things. Um, I think I just saw Cindy. Let me just see if I can grab her kind of uh, difficult. I'm gonna, to find. As you're doing that, uh -huh, I'm going to throw a few things in the chat in terms of articles that may be relevant for this conversation for the audience may want to look at later. Um, I just posted something from AARP that talks about how people look at age from different generations and a good opportunity to just take a, look at a, take a quick look at a video. Please do, please do. Okay, we have Heidi Wassini here. Heidi, wonderful to see you. Um, Good to see you too. Uh, is the sound okay? Because I'm standing outside in the sun here in Denmark. Uh, just stepped out of a meeting to make sure I could join. You well, sound lovely. Actually, you, sound, you sound great, um, Heidi. Um, uh, for the folks who don't know you, can you quickly introduce yourself for you? What it is you do? Of course. Um, I have been working within the TA employer branding space for the past 15 years. Uh, originally came from product management and telco, then moved into HR. Uh, did a career change around my... Uh, 30s, start 30s, I think. And uh, then I, um, I just, just like uh, uh, you were saying early on, once you looked at recruitment, you didn't go anywhere else. And that's kind of what I've been uh, doing the past 15 years in various companies from 10 people to 10,000. Fantastic. And I've just shared your LinkedIn. Please connect with Heidi. And we've got Cindy Trotter here as well. Cindy, great to see you. Um, uh, can you uh, quickly introduce yourself? Who are you? What it is you do? Sure. I'm a, a unique um, individual in HR in that I started HR from college and have never stopped, right? I um, was a recruiter, recruited quickly for a job I thought was intriguing, had to tell my boss, hey, I want that job. And then, um, and here I am um, 40, okay, 35 years later, um, still enjoying it. Um, and I've worked for um, big multinational companies as well as a lot of auto companies. And now I'm working um, on the opposite end in a very small company, um, helping run a technology reinvestment um, and just having a blast. And it really reaffirms how much I love what I do. Fantastic. Great to see you, Cindy. I've just shared Cindy's LinkedIn. Make sure you connect with her as well. Uh, and by the way, I just want to draw everyone's attention to Irina's comment um, on the chat stream there. I think very, very interesting. Age I'm going to read it out. In the US, age discrimination is common. But when I'm asked to source for diversity, it is women, Latino, African-American, LGBTQ+, but never for older people. Um, how very interesting. Uh, folks, um, let me know in the comments, have you ever been given a brief to hire for older workers, like specifically targeting older workers? Have you ever had that, yes or no? Let me know in the comments. If you're watching on LinkedIn, uh, join the conversation, comment on the threads there. Um, okay, let's see what people say as they come in. Uh, but uh, Cindy, let's go to you first. Um, where, what's your take with regards to ageism as far as it goes as from a candidate perspective? Like as a job seeker, as a person who's you know, looking for work or has looked for work, uh, have you encountered this? What did it look like? And what made you feel um, sort of, how did you, how, how did you come to the conclusion if it did indeed happen that that was the, you know, that was ageism was the result of it? Um, in, indeed, let's just um, um, go back to my background. Um, I re um, worked for the first number of years in recruiting, really had a great career. And then I did take a career break for um, to become a mom. And then 13 years later, the um, 2008 recession hit very strongly in auto. We all might um, remember that. I sit in Detroit. And so as my husband lost his job and then I looked at him, he looked at, at myself and like, well, I better go back to work as well. And it's been all sunshine and roses since then. But I remember vividly going back to work and I, I would 
there was um, what I thought was going to be hard was easy. What I thought was going to be easy was hard. I thought that, you know, with my master's in HR and all the experience that I had, um, you know, in recruiting, I was going to just slip right in. However, uh, and what I thought it was going to be hard to leave my family. It was so easy to leave my family. I love them. But to have that intellectual stimulation was wonderful. Um, but the last time I had filed anything was in a filing cabinet versus online. And I had a, a a, a very early career person whiz banging me around the computer, you know, file this, you know, this is how you do it. And I'm like, whoa, I'm like 40 steps behind clicks behind you. And of course you can't actually see when somebody's clicking and they hadn't hired anyone in a number of years. So they hadn't trained anybody because of the downturn in the economy. Um, so it was a, it was a tough reentry. Um, but I did um, work my way back up. Um, I retired as a manager. I've come back as a, as a manager now, but it took me many, it took me 13 years to get to this point where I'm back in um, a management position. Um, but let's go back, um, talking just a little bit more generically about candidates. I think that we, there really is a shiny toy syndrome in candidate in candidates you want that newest greatest candidate and so even when you look internally or externally somehow that candidate externally has a little bit more shine on them than the people that are sitting in front of you and and companies don't look at that person sitting in front of you because you there's no one that's coaching up the team doing the rah 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 they're doing the rah 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 outside of the organization but what I feel they sh companies should do more is coach the team up, set the expectation, give honest feedback to your employees, and then, then remove the detractors and let those that are exhibiting growth behaviors that might be more senior, go ahead and continue to, th to thrive within the organization. You know, Joe, what? let me let me inter intercede here, Cindy, because I think it's a really important point. Like how much energy and investment goes into um the people that you have um and does that change over time um and it seems that it does so for instance the that there was a study i forget what it was so i'll try and pull it out but there was a study that basically looked at the investment on training um onto employees and there was a very clear trend down as to you know based on tenure so in other words um early stage onboarding of course more training that makes sense uh, but then it's just a consistent trend down all the way to almost zero to where a person that's been tenured for a certain period of time almost never gets any training. And then you're thinking, yeah, that's why you might have an internal mobility problem. Or that's maybe why you have a nutrition problem. Um, and certainly why you might understand there to be um, a multi-generational diversity problem because you've literally neglected people um, that perhaps, you know, don't, don't conspicuously signal that they need help. Um, I think when you have reached a certain degree of competence, which presumably if you've had tenure, you know, I'm presuming that you've, you're above a certain competence bar, it may be you just get forgotten about a little bit by management and say, you know what, Heidi's fine or Hung's fine, they're just getting on with it. Uh, and then, yeah, like, like well, what do you do? Um, Heidi, let's switch to you. Um, Let's talk about your current situation, because you said uh, a few things really interesting in, in community recently, which is why I dropped you into this. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this and how, you know, even the, the, the scenario you managed to, to kind of turn up one discrimination, i.e. you having young children, uh, to your advantage? Give us a bit of context on that situation. Tell us what the situation has been. Yeah, so um, I left Avino due to the downscale uh, about 10 months ago. And uh, ever since I've been uh, looking for the right role to, to do in. And while I'm doing that, I'm doing consultancy work. So um, I'm taking my time trying to find the right place. Um, and what I found was that I wasn't really getting invited to interviews, even though I, I felt like I was qualified. I mean, it's always a subjective opinion when, when you apply for jobs. Um, but then what I did was I actually removed eight years of my experience on my um, resume or on my CV. I uh, took away the years of my graduation and then I put in that I have twins that are five years old. Now, I was 45 when I had my kids, which means I'm 51 now. And what happens is I'm, I'm using that unconscious bias that if you have young children, you're probably younger than 55. That I don't think that people think that I would be 51 to have twins at five. Um, 
And uh, so I did that and suddenly I started uh, getting interviews again. Um, and I don't really talk about the eight years unless it's relevant. Um, and at point I have sometimes been asked about age, but mo mainly, hopefully I can kind of go by on my youngish looks and uh, that kind of works. That's actually incredible, um, right? I mean, mysteriously, funny enough. Yeah, I mean, did you, did you get this? I mean, usually when you're um, certainly a woman and you're saying you have a young family, usually that's like a handicap in the sense that you get another sort of prejudice <laughs> against you to say, look, this person is not 100% bought in, yeah. and, you know, they've got other responsibilities. But in this situation, it was actually a benefit because it counteracted yeah. maybe a stronger prejudice on age. Um, yes. And the, the, you're kind of in, you're kind of working with the prejudice of the recruiter uh, to say actually this person must be younger than given mm. uh, sort of the the youth of of, of your kids. Um, well, firstly, let's hope that you know some of these opportunities translate and it's the right one, um, Heidi. By the way, if anybody wants a head of people, a head of TA or whatnot in the Scandinavian area, uh, speak to Heidi. We're seeing a really talented person. Um, but um, Thank you, hon. Um, uh, it, it's one of those where people shouldn't really have to go and do this. Can we understand the psychology as to why? I mean, yes, we can say recruiters are horrible people, but also let's admit we are also recruiters. Um, and I wonder whether we ourselves might have subconsciously made these decisions at some point throughout our careers um, where we have inadvertently preferred one candidate over the another based on this perception. Why does this happen? Um, any thoughts, uh, please? Well, I'll jump in. I think there's some optics, right? Let's be honest. So people take a look. I mean, we are in the United States. We're a very youth culture minded uh, country. And so we idolize youth and we don't tend to hold uh, people of certain age up as uh, gold star standards. Let's put it that way. Uh, I About a couple of years ago, I was hiring an executive assistant for a business owner. And he said, I don't want to hire a Mrs. Doubtfire. Now, that's, again, a cultural reference, but he was saying, I don't want an older woman as my administrative assistant. He goes, give me someone that can represent me and my company. So there's a lot of you know, dog whistles in this around uh, assumptions and uh, optics. So I've been on the other end of that where, you know, you'll see a job application. I'm currently in a job search myself and it'll say, we're looking for a senior talent acquisition partner with one year of experience. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going... Okay, exactly. what, is, what is a senior at anything at one year? So so companies, and this is put, posted by a re recruiter or a human resource person, so you think they'd be the, the gatekeepers to that kind of nonsense, but they're not. So the manager, the business owner, someone saying, I want someone junior in their career. I get that. I can understand saying I want an early career person, but don't put senior anything with one year of experience. So there's all kinds of baked-in bias and uh, – prejudice and basically on, on how we post and look for people. And that's even before we even talk to anyone. I tell candidates, mm -hmm. don't put anything back beyond 10 years because no one cares what you did in the 1990s. No one cares that I worked in Fortune 100 companies in the 80s and 90s. I don't care, frankly. I mean, it's not relevant to what today's market looks like and what I'm trying to bring to the market. But do I have fun telling stories about the 80s and 90s and aughts? Yeah, sure. That's part of who I am. It's part of my makeup. Uh, you know, there's a guy named Chris Farrell. He wrote a book called The Purpose and a Paycheck. He's a local guy. And uh, I put the link, if you like, in, in, the, in the chat. But he, he makes a point that uh, you know, older workers bring a lot of skills and, and added value that don't get acknowledged. There's the emotional intelligence. There's the business acumen. There's the, the perspective. They have the perspective of time. They've made mistakes. They can look at a situation and contextualize. So there's all kinds of values that older workers can bring. We're not very good at promoting those attributes, but and and inside inside companies are not very good at acknowledging those skills as well. Okay. Okay. And also, yeah, Go ahead, Cindy. I, if I could just jump in um, really quick, I think that companies are going to be surprised shortly about the difference in work ethic between my um, uh, the older generation and perhaps the early career um, individuals. Um, my children are 23, 24, and 26. And the perspective I have being their mother when they've entered, as they look and have been in the cor corporate world, I, I mean, 
I'll be up all night doing whatever it needs to be done for tomorrow. And they're like, well, they're not paying me to do this. So, you know, it'll have to happen tomorrow. And I think companies are going to lose out on that particular um, dedication to the to the craft and to um, their projects. All right. Really interesting, uh, Cindy. You have ventured onto thin ice, though, um, but that's OK, because I'm prepared to join you on the thin ice. Um, we're, we're saying, hey, actually, let's roll with some generational stereotypes. All the people might actually work harder because they come from a generation that knows the value of hard work. Gen Z actually don't work as hard because actually they've had it easy. What do you reckon, folks? Is that an outrageous thing to say? Uh, probably is. Um, but uh, but yeah, let, let, let me know what you think. Is it is it a valid way to try and defend the multi-generational workforce by saying, actually, there's different expectations as to your uh, relationships with work? And by the way, just to come back again here to support Gen Z a little bit, maybe the, a renegotiation of work-life balance is not a bad thing. Um, however, from an employer's perspective, at a very brutal input-output scenario, you might actually get more juice out of an old person than you get a younger person. So what do you think? Um, okay. Go ahead. Someone yeah, say. I, yeah um, I, it was me, Heidi. Um, yeah, I, I think there's also a, a cultural aspect here because some of the things that you are talking about are I recognize from my my although limited knowledge of the states, but there are some differences going on with regards to Scandinavia. And I think a lot of it has got to do with the work-life balance. You said, for example, early on that um, people didn't even take their uh, PTO, but I can assure you people do the, take their vacation in Denmark and more than they can have. We have six to seven weeks of vacation in Denmark in the Nordics. Um, and people definitely, um, the majority of them, young or old, will take that vacation. So I think that there is a, a difference in, in also um, the cultural aspects of it. And one of the things that, that you said also, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm so bad with names. Uh, one of the things you said also earlier was uh, the, uh, I think it's got something to do with, with like um, after Corona, value of life has changed in a way. And I think that that has got to do on a personal level rather than on a generational level. And I see all kinds of ages and generations reevaluating what they want out of life, whether they're young or older. And then I think there's also another thing that keeps bugging me, and I have to say it out loud. I'm so tired of being called older because I, 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 I'm supposed to be like senior in five years, but 55 in today versus 55 in the 60s is so massively different in mindset, in, in um, health, in, in workforce and everything else that I really think we re need to also reevaluate what does older mean, what does senior mean, and what is it that we bring in in different perspectives uh, across the different the generations. All right, um, we need to move on on this. Thank you for, for, for the chat, folks. Um, there's a few things that I just want to underline, which is seem, seemingly very interesting in the diversity conversation. Um, one thing that all of us have kind of said, and I actually agree with and, and, and endorse, by the way, um, is that there may well be qualities um, of a tenure or experience that add a specific kind of value to an organization that you might not otherwise get. Uh, so in other words, there is value in having longer. Ex I think there's value in being a parent. I mean, you know, there's lots of lessons learned in doing life activities and life things of this type. Uh, uh, that you simply will not have or not be able to learn if you're very, very narrow and focused. So what we're saying is, is that we're not trying to defend all the workers by saying we're just as good um, as a younger worker. We're saying that there actually is different qualities um, that actually can be complementary to the overall strength of an organization. And by the way, let's just uh, rewind back. You're talking about going back in history, Cindy. Let's go back to prehistory. Um, if you go back to how human beings evolved, generally speaking, we all grew up in kinship groups. They were multi-generational kin kinship groups. Um, it's actually a very modern phenomenon that we started to do age stratification, um, typically from the Industrial Revolution onwards, where we started piping in age cohorts into school and all of your friends and, and, and be became generational and horizontal and not verticalized, whereas previously we had 
a lot stronger vertical relationships across the generations. So maybe we need to rethink that. Folks, we need to move on. Uh, so we're going to say goodbye to Cindy and Heidi here. Thanks for joining us uh, for the conversation. We're going to bring on uh, some of our other guests. We're going to look at it from the employer's perspective. So Heidi, you enjoy the sun. It looks fantastic. Thanks for breaking out to have a chat with us here. Uh, and Cindy, great to Thank see you. you. I, I really appreciate you coming in. Uh, and know sort of from the context there as well, that might have been an extra work. So I, I really appreciate you uh, spending some time with us, uh, Cindy. Thank you again. Cool, cool. Very interesting. Okay, let's bring on some of our other guests who are basically working from the employer side. So I'm, I'm keen to explore, you know, what we're going to do about this. Um, so let's bring on, um, I think, Matthew. I hope you're here. Uh, Matthew Howe. There he is. I'm going to invite him. Um, we also have Vicky Leonard. Uh, let's see where Vicky is. Vicky Leonard, da, 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 there she is. And we're also going to invite on Joe Dalton as well. Um, so this should be great. Let me just see whether Joe is there. Oh no, I really appreciate the uh, the different perspectives and points of view from different parts of the world that this show presents. Hung, and you do this on a you and Adam do this on a regular basis. Uh, you know, here in the United States, we can be very uh, uh, ethnocentric and uh, it's it's helpful to have different points of view worldviews so thank you hey, hey everyone's ev everyone's ethnocentric uh, steve that's one thing that is true um uh, that we all have to admit um and the first step is to recognize that um okay but let's uh, let's say hello to our friends here um so matthew wonderful to see you can you quickly introduce yourself for you what is you do yeah hi nice to meet you yeah, i lead volume recruitment in bt group Fantastic stuff, uh, Matt. Um, we have Vicky there as well. Vicky, can you quickly introduce yourself? Who are you? What it is you do? Hey, so I'm Vicky. I am one of the senior talent acquisition partners at Saga. Um, slightly unique in a company that only focus our market on the over 50s in the UK. Fantastic, Fantastic stuff. And we also have uh, Joe's joining us as well. Wonderful to see you, Joe. Um, can you quickly introduce yourself? Who are you? What it is you do? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Joe Dalton. Um, I own uh, one of Europe's best known headhunting firms for uh, the tech fueled startup and scale up space and also uh, invest in a number of startups that are scaling and sit on a board of uh, a business in scale up mode. Fantastic. Wonderful to have you on the show, Joe. Um, so we've listened a little bit from the candidate perspective uh you know uh the situation where struggling to get in having to fake your you know really remove information about how old you are even introducing other sort of personal bits of detail to just try and get through the door obviously all of this is profoundly unjust and we want to do something about it um uh, the question to you, uh, us three here is you know what can be done and what has been done. So um, I wonder whether we could start with you, Matt. Um, tell us about your know, programs that, you, that that are currently on the way um, at BT that might help uh, you know these different generations into the workforce. Yeah, no, um, no problem at all. So just to start with, um, most of our recruitment at the moment is in, within our front lines. So we're in our EE retail stores, we're in our contact centres, or, or our engineers on the street. But all interact with customers now. Going back to the why we do this, we know that when we reflect our customer base uh, from a demographic point of view, we get better customer outcomes from, from our service results and therefore we get more sales, more, more sales and more value. So there's a real strong why in our business as to, to what we do with this. Now, we've not been using kind of previous experience as an indicator of um, success um, through our recruitment journey for a long, long time. So in our contact centers, our retail stores and our engineers on the on the road you don't submit a cv we don't ask you what you've done previously as a as an indicator as a selection tool however we still know there's a blocker specifically in the older demographic for even hit and apply to be honest and certainly going on and being successful in the kind of in, in the kind of tasks that we ask people to do and we think a lot of that is is down to people just don't feel like a role in the call center a role in a technical store um is something they can do or have ever thought of when actually it probably is average age of a customer that walks into our retail store is is about 54. Um, so you will be interacting with people who are just like you and we need people like you. So we've done some trials recently to try and break that down. Um, so it, it kind of we've, we've worked with a few external partners 
uh, to help us with this. And we've we've tried to remove some of our brand from it a little bit as well, especially EE is, is it can be seen as a younger person's brand at times. Obviously, there's a lot of work being done in, in that space anyway. Um, but when we go to market, we sometimes go via a partner. So we've been working with a company called um, Read, in part, Read, Read um, Talent Solutions to, to help us with this on the trial in, in Cardiff. Um, and off the back of that, what we've actually offered is instead of a, an employment opportunity, we've offered a reskilling opportunity. So if you take our contact center specific, what we've said is um, we've got these uh, these roles that we think would be absolutely perfect for, for somebody from an older demographic, life experience, they understand our customers. Um, they're part-time, so they fit around people with other things going on in their life. Uh, but we know that you may have never considered doing that and you're, never, you're not sure if, if you're capable of doing it. So instead of coming to us, applying for an interview, come and see us, we'll tell you all about us and we will skill, we'll give you some skills in this industry. If you then choose to go for a, an interview with us, we'll guarantee you it. But what we'll assess you based on is not something you've previously done, we'll assess you based on what you've learned in those days, so what we've taught you. What we've seen off the back of that, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, Matt. I mean, that is actually brilliant. Um, I mean, isn't that amazing, guys? I mean, some really sort of rethinking some fundamentals of the recruiting process, which basically causes the block to apply. Because we're we're talking about ageism uh, so far, but it's been from candidates that have actually applied. We forget about actually the huge bulk of people that have self-selected themselves out for a number of erroneous reasons. Namely, number one, the stereotype of the job that might be presented always in a certain way. So for instance, how many TV adverts have we seen that represent a job of this demographic and actually subconsciously you rule yourself out? Um, so you, there's a branding issue you need to deal with. Branding from an employer's perspective, you might have inadvertently or deliberately created a brand which connects more intuitively with a certain demographic than others, but maybe that's not what you want when it comes to um, uh, diversifying your workforce in which case consider working with a third party that can help you launch uh, the communication strategy to a different demographic. And the third thing that you mentioned, which I thought was superb, was you, you kind of take down the commitment level. Uh, and I mean this in, the right, in, in a non-pejorative way, but when you apply for a job, it feels like a life-changing or a definitive thing, doesn't it? Um, you know, I apply for a job doing this. Like I've got to imagine myself doing that job and all of my life might change around this. But no, you say instead it's a reskilling. I could be doing that on a Sunday afternoon because I've got a spare afternoon. You know, I, I just want to develop my skills. I don't necessarily need to commit then uh, to do the job. Let me, like, dip my toe into the water to do it. So I love that, Matt. And I interrupted you before you're going to finish off with some results. So why don't you just say uh, what the outcome of all of this work has been? Yeah, look, the, the metrics are, are are fantastic. I mean, you get a hundred percent shirt rate for interviews, which in a volume space just doesn't happen, uh, right? Because again, the commitment element and it's a giving back. People are signing up to get something for themselves, not just to tell us something. Off the back of that, we've got kind of an eighty-five percent conversion rate at it at the the next stage interview versus a, a regular kind of fifty percent that we that we get. And then we're in relatively early days of, of trialing this with, with an older demographic. This is actually the approach we use for our, our apprentices as well, which is interesting. It works for both ends of the scale. But what we're seeing is, is that when people join us, they're, they're performing really well. Um, they're not leaving us and they're not absent, which again, in a, in a frontline perspective, these are some of the key measures that we need. So it's working really well at the moment. We're also building it out into our retail space as well. What a wonderful case study, folks. Follow Matt Howe if you want to know more about this. By the way, I've seen people start to connect with each other on the chat stream, which is exactly what we should be doing. And in fact, I nearly forgot to do it. So well done, everyone there for reminding me. Um, uh, we always want to make sure that Brain Food Live is a show that continues the conversation. It's a conversation starter, not a conversation stopper. However, we do need to come off air. Um, so at some point, we have to come off air. Uh, but don't let that stop you from speaking about this topic or connecting with others that care about it. Uh, so take a moment, grab your LinkedIn URL and share it in the chat stream on Crowdcast and then connect with everyone else who's done the same. Uh, if you're watching this on the multiple LinkedIn's that are out there, uh, then do the same on the comment thread. Just grab your LinkedIn URL and stick it into the comment thread there and then just connect with everyone else you see. Um, every week, you should be getting 20, 30, 40, 50 new connections for people who care about this topic. Uh, it's free to do, so you might as well go ahead and do it. Um, okay, cool, cool. Um, let's go to you, Vicky. Um, I, I didn't actually know that your business 
what a service hires only a certain demographic? I mean, give me some context here. No, it's it's, it's all our customer base. So we focus solely on going to market to the um, experienced generation, as we kind of refer to older workers internally. So whether that's across insurance, travel, cruise, and kind of more media products, you can only qualify for these if you are over fifty. Um, so similar to Matt, we want our people on our front line to be able to understand this demographic. Um, who better to help someone with their life insurance, their car insurance, than someone who's been there and is using those products as well? Fantastic. Um, and so this has been, I guess, has this all like was this a strategy, a recruitment strategy for the business uh, from a long term, or did, was there a moment when you realised actually, yeah, we we need to hire some of the people that we're actually selling to? I think it's I think it's always been there, but I think a lot more is kind of coming to the forefront now, I guess going back to contact centre, maybe it's not the easiest area to hire into as to kind of thinking outside the box. And we do see people that um, have retired, we had a retired head teacher who he didn't want to be doing that anymore. He didn't want to get away from that. He just wanted to come and help people and have a conversation. And ultimately that's what we need people to do. And it's, it's only going to, as you said, the, de- the gap is increasing. We still need people to fill these roles. It's a no brainer to bring them in. Can I ask, how do you bring them in? Because a lot of the people that have, let's say, re- retired or they've gone through a moment where they've stepped away from work on a full-time basis, they may have deactivated LinkedIn or they may not be logging in anymore. They certainly haven't constructed a CV and not pinging it around because of the past that, that period, but they do have some capacity. You know, They're able to do some time. Maybe it's a part-time role, doesn't have to be 40 hours in an office. You know, uh, How do you actually find them? What's the attraction uh, a sort of or sourcing approach? So I think we've, we've naturally got a kind of a high footfall on our website when people are kind of coming to look at our products. So there's a big, um, if you go to our careers page, a lot of it is around the older workforce. Um, some of the articles in our magazine also link to how to write a CV or how to approach returning to work. So that actually, you might have been looking at us, oh, yeah, I need to buy some insurance, but some, an article's caught your eye. Um, and we're really focused on all our employer brand, making sure that we use the oldest um, generation in our marketing. Um, to go out there but also showing what we do once you're in the organization it's all well and good that in ta we're providing with a great service <laughs> up until day one but we need to kind of show that actually once you've joined us you're actually going to feel part of this whether that's through um diversity forums or kind of communities to go back to your point earlier steve about not being able to talk to people about the same topics well actually there's a you can join this group on our internet so you can discuss common TV shows that the right age group's watching. You might not be interested in Love Island in the same way. That's <laughs> that's what I said in talk or soft play. Um, but there's always a lens on age. So when it was Pride, we used to, um, we work with the Silver Rainbows. So a Pride group, but also age is part of that, just to keep that conversation going throughout everything that we do. Very, very interesting. So one of the techniques, if you do indeed sell to a multi-generational d- demographic or with regards to Vicky's business, selling specifically to that demographic, obviously that's already a channel for recruiting. Um, you might as well put some recruiting um, sort of uh, uh, opportunities or con- content alongside some of the marketing content you're putting in anyway. Um, that makes perfect sense to me uh, and a really smart way uh, to to do the acquisition side of it. Uh, very, very interesting. Joe Dalton, going to you, different type of take. Um, you're doing headhunting stuff. You're doing sort of senior recruiting. Um, what's, the, what's the context where you've encountered um, ageism, would you say, in that scenario? Have you, have you sort of found it from... Uh, the, the clients that you're servicing where they have objected to someone based on age or, you know, uh, does it does it occur in the way I'm imagining? <laughs> I'm quite interested. Oh, in absolutely. Um, age diversity in tech fueled startups and scale ups matters so much. Um, the ageism um, from a recent report shows that it starts within the tech startup and scale up space from age 29. So, you know, some of us um, have yeah. got a few decades on that. You know, the average age of a founder within startups and scale ups uh, in the ecosystem that I'm Im- immersed in um, is 38. So, yeah, it, there, there's a lot of ageism and it's something I'm really passionate about because age diversity in the future of technology that's going to impact 
the planet. We work with the founders that are making the apps that we all use on our phones. And if we haven't got diversity of thought and if, if we haven't got age diversity in the product development, then all of those apps are going to be skewed in the wrong way. Um, I was looking at doing a presentation a couple of days ago and I put into the um, open art AI tool, an image of a group of 50 year olds. And I got just a sea of silver hair and people that look like my great great grandfather. Um, and so I think that's just Im important in itself that the people that are creating the AI tools, um, we aren't inputting the right data. And that's why we're not getting the right outcomes. But yeah, it's, it's a really important topic and something that um, um, I'm personally doing a, a lot of work on at the moment to try and um, just champion better stereotypes um, and get that intergenerational uh, cross mentoring, reverse mentoring going, um, making sure that uh, entrepreneurs that are starting businesses in their 50s and 60s get more exposure so that people can see that there is so much wisdom there and that they can help recycle some of that wisdom into the startup ecosystem. Yeah, very interesting. I just want to uh, uh, highlight uh, Mark Miller apparently runs a podcast. I've just seen in the chat there um, to the effect that it's always uh, looking for guests who are going to be talking um, uh, uh, on uh, guests who from the second half of their careers who, who want to come onto the show. Um, so yeah, I would anybody who's listening to this, uh, watching this, and you know, is a person that's into the second half of their career and they want to kind of. Uh, get more visible, then it seems to me that that could be a good uh, good opportunity for you to do that. Um, okay, let's switch tack a little bit in terms of I'm a job seeker. I'm over 55. I'm knocking on the door. I get the sense um, that I'm basically, yeah, I'm getting ruled out because of age. Um, uh, what's the advice um, that we have for that person other than going to companies like BT or Saga or whatever. Um, I mean, there's certain companies out there that seem to be particularly uh, amenable uh, to people who are, are from the older uh, workforce. Um, uh, but aside from that selection, what else could or should that person be doing um, in terms of optimizing their, their, their chances? Thoughts on well, that? I would suggest you drop your AOL account first. So get off AOL. That, that <laughs> ages you faster than that. I say, I think you just lean, you lean, as they say, lean in. You actually say, this is who I am. This is what I've done. Don't take ages or don't take dates off your resume. Don't go back to prehistoric times. But I think just being honest and authentic with people is diversity is not just about ethnicity. And I think diversity of experiences, diversity of background, that's kind of how you, you, you lead. You lead in with, this is the package. This is what you get. Do you know what? There's two things that's interesting there. Number one, I think the AOL thing is actually correct. Um, it is pretty bad branding to have a very old email domain. It's worth just switching that out. Um, even though I know it's painful to move, move sort of emails around, but I do think that probably has an impact. Um, second thing is that I wonder whether older workers need to be putting, like leaning into the diversity angle. So it, 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 does the word diversity appear in your CV? If not, it should. Um, because you may not be aware that right now and in the next coming years or more, you're, you will now become a underrepresented group, um, in which case it may become to your advantage to, to, to kind of connect very much with what companies want to do. Companies definitely are driving to try and hire more multi-generationally. I did a poll on recruiting brain food newsletter last week um, to find out you know, what the percentage of formal and informal programs they were. Uh, together, they were like over 40, 50, I think nearly 50% had some sort of program, official or unofficial, to try and create a more multi-generational workforce. That percentage is only gonna get bigger. So if you're a, a, a worker in your 55s and plus, why not kind of lean into that, lean into where the corporate trends are and then make sure you're speaking the language within your CV, LinkedIn or whatever it might be so that you can connect with that. That's a really good point, Steve. Um, okay, thoughts on this, Matt? Your your advice for an older worker? Yeah, look, I think um, a lot of barriers are perceived. 
Um, and there's not many companies that I'd speak to that, that don't want to try and hire multi-generational. Um, often they don't know how to go about it, but remove if, if as a job seeker you overcome that per perception of a barrier, then I think you will find you're actually knocking on an open door in a lot of instances. Um, so I think that helps. Right. Really important point. Are you self-selecting yourself out? Yes, we know there's ageism that exists, but if that's too prominent in your mind, sometimes that can be an additional unnecessary handicap, right? Because you're thinking all the time, oh, I'm being discriminated against. I better not apply. No, push the button, apply. Um, and, and, you know, don't carry that on. Uh, sort of don't, don't let a bad situation get worse by your self-perception of it. Um, okay, cool. Vicky, your thoughts on this? I think just just reach out to to your network and to any recruitment contacts you've got um, and have a conversation to help you overcome that barrier. Even if you speak to one great recruiter that hasn't got a role in that organisation at that point, if they can relieve any worries that you've got and tell you actually there are some great companies out there and it's, we've all got networks, we've all got recommendations to help each other out. Is there a recruitment company that deals with this as a, as a diversity kind of angle? Because that will emerge if it doesn't. Um, uh, you know, we've seen it emerge in, in multiple instances, agencies and platforms. Is there something for people at the over 55 plus? If not, there's a business opportunity for you. Um, OK, Joe, your thoughts on this advice to an older worker? Yeah, I give it all the time, every single day, day in and day out. And it's relevance. You've got to be relevant for what's going on in the market right now. Um, it's it, it's just so important to understand what are the buzzwords of the moment. Make sure that your online brand and your persona is current and it's talking about the issues of today um, and get rid of any language from uh, the past. Uh, read up, comment um, on forums, understand what's going on. Um, and I think just network, get in front of as many people as possible. Really, really good advice. So staying current, I think that's good advice for everybody, but particularly if you carry this uh, sort of prejudice that other people might have for you that you've kind of left behind, you don't have the, the choice. You have to really lead with it. So lean into everything. Obviously, read things like brain food, but other stuff, just connect with information sources. That's going to help educate you and set aside time to do that. Um, and from your own self-perception point of view, however you're showing yourself online, that kind of needs an audit. You can, it needs a freshen up in, in a way um, to say, you know what, again, this is not like saying uh, going to extremist lengths and disguising things unless you really have to. Uh, but it's more a case of, you know what, are you using the language? Are you in the right conversational spaces that help you uh, 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 help, help, help you feel as if you're connected to the, to, to the big topics of today? I would add, stay connected to your network, too. I mean, I mean, older workers have a lot of connections that they've built over their career. And those people may be aging out of the workforce, but they also have great connections in organizations. I think the referral and uh, network process for older workers is critical. We actually need to do a show on networking um, because I, I think that a lot of us don't know, like we all know how to do it, quote unquote, but have we really crystallized it and have we actually got a, 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 like an idea as to how to systematically get better at this? Probably not. Most of us are just relying on our charisma, right? We, yeah, I'm going to go in this room. I'm going to just be hilarious. And then suddenly you're going to be Lord, you'll be a great networker. No, you can be that and you can also have a plan. So maybe that's going to be useful. Folks, if you're interested in me doing a networking show and getting some super networkers in to talk about it, let me know in the comments whether this will be valuable um, and we'll get that set up. Um, and I want to separate the networking from the profile. I think they're related, uh, but they're both uh, sort of very, very important, but also can operate independently. And this leads back to what you were saying, Joe. Your online profile has got to be like, you can do more with it. All of us can. Um, and too often we've just neglected it. When's the last time you actually looked at your LinkedIn? When's the last time you actually did any editing on your profile? Go ahead and do that. Um, and by the way, if you're on places like LinkedIn, it's a great place to just increase your visibility so that more people can see you. So one of the things, by the way, which I've been promoting, which I think some of you have actually adopted, is to say you can broadcast Brain Food Live every Friday on your own LinkedIn. 
and you could do it for free. Um, why do I promote this? Not because it's like useful for brain food, because it, it really isn't. I don't collect any data on that. Um, however, what it does do is it draws viewing traffic to your profile because uh, people might be interested in this conversation. So if you're going to do this, all you need to basically, if you uh, are sometimes looking for things to say online, well, you know what? Have a think of what shows are going live, what's being restreamed, and lots of them have the ability for you to retype it in. Um, Brain Food is one of those. So go ahead and do that. It's totally free to use. Okay, listen, we have to leave it at that because we're out of time. Let me thank our guests. They've been amazing. Matthew Howe, wonderful to see you and well done on your uh, amazing program there. We'd love to hear more about that at a later point. Uh, Vicky, wonderful to see you as well. Thank you so much for introducing us uh, to the philosophy at Saga. Wonderful to see all of this. And Joe, great to see you. Um, I, I'm not sure we've ever had the proper chance to connect, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make it a, a thing uh, for us to actually have a one-to-one. -one Good. <laughs> um, because uh, we've not had enough time today. Wonderful to have you and great, uh, great to see you on the show, uh, uh, Joe. Thank you for having me. Look forward to connecting with you all later. Yeah, make sure you connect with all of our wonderful guests, for everybody. Um, so thank you, all of us, for that. That was great. We'll be back next week. We're going to be talking about um, where employer branding and uh, politics collide. I'll be broadcasting this from Nashville, Tennessee, uh, where I'll be uh, spending a couple of days having, uh, I'm going to do a talk at RefFest USA. Very excited to see that. So if you're going to RefFest, I will see you there. But hey, really important topic when we're talking about politics. Reason why, guess what? There's, there's cultural wars everywhere, but particularly acute in the US. And in fact, that is having cascading effects to people in recruiting. So for instance, what does it mean if you are hiring for a company that is headquartered or has a job in a state that suddenly has changing kind of rights when it comes to women's right to choose? Does that impact your ability to hire women? Answer is it does. And we have evidence for that because Pavel Adrian, who is the head of labor market economics at LinkedIn, at, at Indeed, is joining us for that show. And he's actually written a paper on this, uh, which is the most sort of up-to-date information as to how the Dodds versus Jackson, I think it is, uh, ruling has impacted apply rate um, for jobs in certain locations. Very important for US friends to um, go ahead and sign up for this. And indeed, anybody uh, who's interested in how, you know, the wider cultural uh, sort of problems that we have, how does that actually impact us in recruiting and HR? Okay, sign up for that and we'll see you next week. Cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a bit breathless, uh, Steve, wasn't it? But um, uh, that you but, pack a lot uh, in, hung. You do a good job of packing a lot in a tight space, and uh, I'm sw I'm sweating, man. I don't know whether your you ability are, to curate is uh, is uh, amazing. So congratulations, well done. I and I look forward to seeing you next week as well. This will be my first uh, national recruiting conference that I've ever gone to, and the fact that it's outdoors and it's a little unconventional with circus tents and uh, riding bulls and. Uh, pop-up pop tents it's gonna be interesting and I'm fun gonna, i'm gonna give my talk from a, a from a, a a bull an electronic bull which i reckon um i think that will be well quite I, I challenge you for a a, a write-off uh, actually i put the challenge out anyone 65 and older wants to challenge me i'm going to stay on for 65 seconds so that's my goal you, you and sound, anyone you, that's 65 you sound or older they're <laughs> you sound disturbingly confident, Steve. I wonder whether you, you, you're some sort of... I don't know where I get it. I've never been on one before, so it'll be a new experience. <laughs> okay, hey, let's Before I go, though, I do have to share one thing with you. You know, this is the harvest season in the Midwest for produce. This came out of our backyard. This is a zucchini. What am I looking at? Oh, my it goes Lord. Sense of scale. So, I've never um, seen anything that size on a... It's, it's almost obscene in a way, but it's... Uh, uh, we've got like eight or nine of these in our backyard. It's quite crazy from a small little... Uh, above ground garden my spouse does a great job so a lot of zucchini bread zucchini cookies uh zucchini lasagna zucchini 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 <laughs> if, you're, if you're coming to breakfast get ready for a zucchini sandwich courtesy of steve jewel and... uh, i think more ribs i think we're gonna do more barbecue than zucchini. yeah yeah cool cool <laughs> All right, man. Listen, that's it, Steve. Listen, thanks for co-hosting, man. Really, really good job. Really enjoyed um, it. Tell Adam he he doesn't have to worry about losing his job, so he's he's secure in that. He's out. Um, now, listen. But I'm I'm happy to sub anytime. You ever need a backup? You got you got your man. Good to know, man. Listen, I will see you next week, man. Look forward to it. Terrific. Take care. Have a great weekend. Bye.